Good afternoon and welcome to uh, what I would say the most important uh, brief uh, so far uh, on the subject of inclusive growth. My name is Charlotte Petrigonitska and today I'm a moderator, uh, but I'm very, very active working for this issue. I'm so uh, happy to have three very informed people and influential people uh, on uh, on the spot here today because we're going to ask you tough questions. Uh, we have Rick Sammons uh, from the World Economic Forum and the Management Board. We have two finance ministers. We have Ms. Minister Mono from Canada and Minister Gatete from Rwanda. Uh, so uh, once again, very welcome. And welcome to our audience online. Uh, we will spend 29 minutes from now on this very uh, important topic. And may I just say, uh, we have been talking about inclusive growth for many years. It's been one of the kind of the buzz headings for, for, for a lot of what we want to achieve. But while we have been talking, we, we have seen that uh, actually the, de the development is going in an opposite direction. We, we see inequalities increasing. We don't see inclusive growth necessarily increasing. We also uh, see that uh, there are some governments who take this as a priority, but very few governments. Uh, and international bodies and governments who want to really uh, find ways to, to, to go from words to what they mean uh, are struggling on where to start and where to entry. Uh, we're going to hear a little bit from, from all of you, but I would like to start uh, to ask you, Rick, uh, World Economic Forum, how do you view this issue of inclusive growth? And if I may be a bit uh, tough on you, I mean, this is where we're going to solve these issues, responsible leadership and all of that. It's all about this, I would have thought. Uh, so uh, do you feel kind of sense of urgency in contributing to this? I, I agree with the premise of your question, uh, Charlotte, that um, this is one of the most central issues implicated by the theme that you just uh, referred to, responsive and responsible leadership. This is certainly one of the largest issues hanging over the international community right now, and indeed this uh, meeting here in Davos this week. Uh, I think it's fair to say that there's a broad, uh, even worldwide consensus on the direction of inter inclusive growth. People recognize that we need to find a way uh, both to have growth, because unless the pie expands, it's very difficult for everybody's peace to expand over time, but we also need a more socially inclusive model of generating that. Uh, the problem, as you have just pointed out, is that that's, it's more aspiration than action currently, mm -hmm. although we have two uh, governments represented here who, from my perspective, rep uh, are uh, governments that really think seriously and have a, ha have a strategic framework for thinking through how to in infuse their growth process with social inclusivity, mm -hmm. as opposed to try to compensate for the problems after the fact, and it's terrific that they're here to, to articulate a little bit of how they, their governments approach this issue. For our part, we decided about a year or so ago, seeing this uh, d distance between aspiration and action, that we just try to think about um, through uh, historical experience, uh, observation of practice, and scholarship, just what the e economics research uh, shows, what, uh, whether there's some frameworks and some tools that might be useful for governments that do have this ambition. And we released earlier in the week this inclusive growth and development report, and I'll just give you a few, uh, just a skeleton of what, what is in here. Uh, first, it articulates uh, a bottom line. And, and this is, I think, maybe it sounds subtle, but I think it's significant. Uh, growth is, is absolutely crucial, but it's worth thinking about growth as a top line indicator of national success. And for business people, they'll understand the, uh, the, the metaphor here. The bottom line way most people evaluate the success of the performance of their economy is not the growth figure that's published in the uh, statistics in the newspaper. It's basically whether their standard of living progresses. And standard of living has an income element, has a jobs, job opportunity aspect to it, has this economic security, and also quality of life. And I think policymakers first have to more explicitly rec recognize that that is indeed the bottom line uh, North Star, if you will, for the compass setting. Secondly, we, uh, through this research, identified 15 areas of policy. It tends to be structural and institutional pol and strength and incentives, 
in these 15 different areas, which are actually quite important, particularly important, for driving growth with equity. And uh, this is, in effect, this policy ecosystem, this structural policy ecosystem. It, it cuts across infrastructure, labor, education, uh, corruption, basic services in the health field, uh, social protection. There's a whole panoply of things where you have win-wins between growth and equity. And most governments don't really think about that as an ecosystem of policy that deserves to be have a similar level of attention as the traditional focus of finance ministers and chief economic advisors, which is macroeconomic policy, fiscal and monetary policy, and trade ministers, which is trade policy, and the like. Those, are, those latter elements of policy are absolutely crucial because they're critical for driving growth. But this ecosystem of structural and institutional strength across these different areas is, in effect, the implicit income, income distribution system of an, of an economy. It's, the, it's how you can infuse your growth process with more equity, if you will, instead of just trying to compensate for it after the fact. So we've laid that out as a framework. We think that the, the basic bottom line here is that it behooves governments that are trying to solve this puzzle to cultivate this uh, institutional strength, this structural policy ecosystem uh, over time and to maintain it, look where they're strong or weak relative to their peers. And that, in effect, constitutes that rebalancing of policy priorities constitutes a new growth model, if you will, a new mental map. And then finally, what we've done here is suggest that, OK, it's one thing to have the framework and the, and the new mental model and a new compass setting of living standards. The next thing you need is basically good information, like a business. You got a big problem in a business, uh, very often what you do is you try to benchmark. Who's doing it well? How do I stack up against that? And so we put some cross-country information covering 109 countries in here in all of these different dimensions to let people look at it. And the last thing is, well, you also need a performance metric. And so what's a good performance metric for progress in living standards? GDP is just a part of that puzzle. Yeah. We need a larger one. So we've laid out a dashboard of 12 key KPIs, key performance indicators, and and we, see you, we provide the data for all the countries, we roll it up into a single index, and we, something called the Inclusive Development Index, and we let countries see where they stand on inclusive development relative to where they rank in the world on GDP. And these are all basically just a toolbox to help governments. And by that toolbox, you are triggering action, we hope. And we, we, we see uh, a very interesting attempt. Uh, Minister Morneau, I, I think you actually embarked uh, on a, to be a test case in this. <laughs> That's my way of expressing it. Please tell us about uh, your view on this and how you go about it. Well, um, Rick was nice to say he agreed with the premise of the question. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not sure I'd agree that we embarked to be a test case. I mean, okay, we, good. We, because we embarked with a purpose. The purpose was uh, really to think about how we could do better mm -hmm. for Canadians. Mm -hmm. And uh, really, we set, up, we set down on this path it's been a couple of years now. We, mm -hmm. We've been in office for 15 months. So the discussion with Canadians started before that. And it was really very much about talking about the challenge in having a, uh, uh, an economy that, that benefited all Canadians, a, a concern that middle class Canadians in particular, that uh, the people that were maybe uh, lower on the income scale were just not seeing the benefits from growth that gave them the optimism that the next generation was going to be better mm. off than the current generation. Mm. And if you, if you sort of think to the promise that, uh, that at least in our country, and I think it's, it's not just Canada, it really is to, to, uh, to parents that they can see a future where their children are going to be better off than they were. And, uh, you know, that's uh, aspirational, but it's what we've been able to deliver over, over a period of, of the post-war generations. So uh, we saw really a, um, a, a change in the sense that there was that promise was really not being realized for the middle mm -hmm. class, that the benefits of growth were, were really accruing much more to those at the top of society. And so we embarked on thinking about, in our context, what could we do to make a difference for mm -hmm. uh, middle class Canadians that would create uh, you know, a positive circle where we created uh, you know, a sense of optimism because the families could see that they were doing better, which creates then the willingness to make the investments that are going to allow the economy to keep growing. So, so it's, it, it is a circle that we're trying to achieve. And we started by thinking very 
uh, specifically about middle class Canadians uh, that were facing challenges and how we could help them. So, um, you know, the, the report uh, for us is going to be enormously helpful as we move forward, as we think about benchmarking. But our starting point was to create a positive uh, experience, a positive sense for Canadians. We, we lowered taxes on the middle class and we, we, were, we very explicitly did it at the same time as we raised taxes on the top 1%. We said that you know, the equation that had been um, in place for the last generation had been starting not to work and so that's how we went out and talked to Canadians. We mm -hmm. said we're going to make a difference for you and it's going to be um, a progressive in terms of taxation. In doing that we helped uh, 9 million Canadians who have lower tax rates now and 1% who have higher tax rates. And then we, we looked at the, the benefits that we have currently for uh, Canadian citizens that were universal, and the, the one that's had the biggest impact is our childcare benefits. We had a few different childcare benefits, um, and the most important one was a universal benefit going to all Canadians, irrespective of wealth, mm. meaning it included the, the most wealthy. And we, we took that, we uh, decided to means test it, we uh, added more money to it because we felt that, that was a place where we could have a real impact mm -hmm. and uh, significantly changed outcomes for uh, lower and middle income uh, Canadians. So, you know, to give you context, it's, uh, it's thousands of dollars on an after-tax basis for, um, for, you know, a, a woman, a single woman with two children. Uh, so a big difference in, uh, in her situation if she's earning thirty or $40,000. So, so a, a, a really material change there, and it, what it's going to do in, uh, in, in metrics, in, in calendar year 2017, we will see a 40% reduction in child poverty in our country uh, mm -hmm. versus uh, three years ago. So a very significant change. Mm -hmm. and, and so, so creating that sense of optimism, we think, is really important as we embark on growth initiatives. So uh, as we think about how we're going to grow the economy, we promise to make significant investments in infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure that would you know, help people today, but really create a more productive economy for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We recognize that that's important, but without having the confidence of the population to say we're going to make those investments mm -hmm. that are going to make your life different, you know, we might not get the public support. So, so we hope that um, we can be a beacon to show that inclusive growth is, is absolutely possible, mm -hmm. but you need to take decisions that deal with the actual issue on the table. And, and that is that there are people who feel like they are not as well off as they, they expected to be, and therefore their confidence is going to be less. Starting to do this uh, with, with Canadians, mm -hmm. Uh, we're having positive results. Uh, we think that that will beget more positive uh, results and allow us to continue investing in the future. Um, that's the that's the goal. But it's a very compelling case, and 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 also to be discussing this with two finance ministers. Uh, we're talking about growth. We we add the word inclusive. Perhaps we don't have to add that word uh, in some years from now because it's so evident that that's what it's about. Uh, we, ha we are implementing the Sustainable Development Goals. They are all about inclusive growth within planetary boundaries. We are talking about one national example here. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the discussion has, has been exactly around that. Can we use uh, similar models just uh, in any context? And, and, and I guess I'd, I'd like to ask you, Minister Gatete, you're not necessarily dealing with uh, middle-income people who are disappointed. You're, you're dealing with perhaps a different point of departure for this work. Uh, what are your solutions to, to this issue? And, and where do you see, if you see, similarities to, to what we just heard? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I understand what he's saying. I used to work in the government yeah. uh, in Canada. But in the situation... Canada. So, <laughs> so we have sort of a Canadian... Yes. <laughs> so the situation in Rwanda is uh, very, very different. I remember when I left and I went to Rwanda, uh, immediately after the genocide in 1994, I found a situation uh, that you cannot explain. The whole social economic fabric had collapsed. The poverty levels were 78%. The economy had declined by half. Mm. Inflation was 64%. You can imagine how the situation was at that point. The GDP per capita was 146 US dollars per person. Since that time to today, it has increased five times. We are now 
coming to 740 US dollars per capita. We are aiming to become a middle income country. Now, from there, we had to have the two-track economic uh, development. One that would grow the economy so that we can get the benefit out of the economic, economic growth. Another one that would address the poverty levels. From there, we have really been working on the poverty levels. And two years uh, ago, the extreme poverty was at 16%. The overall poverty was at 39%. And our target is by 2020 to make sure that there's no extreme poverty and the poverty levels generally should be below 20%. That's our target and that's how we work. Mm -hmm. And the first thing is, before even you talk about the inclusive development, you have to understand your society. What are their needs? How really, uh, what are the key issues? And to do that, we do the measurement. And I think uh, uh, you are right, you're right. Only looking at GDP per capita would really not be sufficient. It's good, but it's not sufficient. It shows you how the economy is growing. But then for us, we look at so many other elements, from human development uh, index to uh, human poverty index. We look at the gender-related development index, because for us, gender is very, very important. Then we do the survey, the household survey that give us showing uh, the income distribution and where it is located in each district, in each sector of the country, and also in which groups of the people. Mm -hmm. So once we look at all that, and at the same time we combine it with access, because for us is, access is very important. Access, uh, uh, access to water and sanitation, access to electricity, access to education, access to health. For health now we have the universal coverage for everybody in Rwanda. We have the two-tier system. If you are working, they deduct money from your salary. If you are not working, we have another program that caters for the rest of the people. So meaning that actually any benefit would be coming back to address access. We also look at the access to finance. We also look at access to ICT, because ICT is now a tool to be used by almost everyone. Mm. We look at access to transport and so forth. And then from there, that's when we say, as government, how do we invest our money? How do we invest the public money to address the key problems that we see in our society? Let me just give you an example how we address it. There was the issue of land, and when you are promoting the access to finance, and we realized that the women didn't actually own anything. They didn't, the land was owned by men. So we had to reform the law to make sure that women have access to land. And now, the 18% of all the land in the country is owned by men. But for women only, it's 26%. And the rest is shared land and government. Meaning they can use the title deeds to access money from the banking system. Initially, they couldn't. So those are the kind of roadblocks that we are trying to eliminate to make sure that uh, we can solve some of the issues of our society. So over time, we also innovate to make sure that we assist those at the lower end. At the lower end, you have created a program and I was looking at the Canadian program, for example, of social welfare, uh, where it caters for those that are really disadvantaged. In our case, we don't have the money that can care from the central government. So we created a social protection program, of which actually part of the money is borrowed uh, from the World Bank and from others. And then also we put the government budget to make sure that we can do two things. Those people who are uh, disadvantaged but who have the energy to work, we provide the skills, we provide resources, so that they can really graduate out of poverty. Others who cannot because they are too old and all that, those are the only ones who are supported, who get direct support. So we had to make sure that we cater for the entire population from the lower end up to the upper end, and we measure accordingly. Mm -hmm. Every year we do the measurement to see exactly what are the remaining gaps so that we can be able to fill them. Mm -hmm. So what you're talking about, really inclusive development. If you don't address it, one way or the other, it will hit back. And it has hit back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, we, we have uh, some 10 minutes for questions. Uh, so I would like to invite uh, questions from the audience. Uh, can I see a hand, please? Take the opportunity now to challenge these this influential stewards of inclusive growth. Yes, please. And pre please present yourself. Yes, I'm Fortier. <laughs> I'm the principal and vice chancellor of McGill University. Um, I think we all agree this is a very important goal. And the big challenge is to achieve it in a reasonably good time. So uh, what, what I'm asking you is, what are the measures that you're taking that you can say, this will move the needle, this will change the situation, say, 
in five years, as opposed to 10, 15. You know, in my field, we know that education is, a, is an important thing, but it's a long term. What are the initiatives that will be delivering in shorter times? So we can, we can allow for two more questions and ask our panelists to respond to them. Yes, we have one, and please, again, I think you waved, yes, you did. <laughs> Please present yourself. So Sean Osborne, the president and CEO of the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship. We teach uh, high school age, middle, even middle school age kids uh, how to be entrepreneurs. Just curious if um, uh, part of uh, the programs that you look at implementing uh, include education. Okay, so we have questions around measurements, uh, not short term, but within five years. And, and if we include education, do we have a... Another question? Yes, please. Hello, uh, Peter Van, I'm a Global Leadership Fellow at the World Economic Forum. Um, so I heard uh, talking about a two-track plan for uh, economic uh, policy, one based on growth, the other one based on uh, eradicating poverty uh, or strengthening the middle class, I guess, in the case of, of Canada. Um, my question would be, um, is, there, is there a consensus about that also um, in the country that 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 faces most uh, most the most problematic situation right now, the United States, um, uh, that indeed raising taxes or spending more public money uh, is needed uh, or is, is is wished for um, to help the middle class strengthen. I've heard more talk about um, pro-growth plans than about the. Uh, uh, tax raising and, and, and public money spending uh, part of it? Uh, that's an issue that has been discussed very much over these days in, in, in Davos. The kind of, of at context in which we are talking about growth and uh, if society is, is, is going away or going in to try to solve this issue. So uh, I think it's a mixture of questions and I'm not going to divide them between you. Uh, so I will allow all of you to respond and you can, uh, we allow them to pick and choose, but please try to respond to all of them. And I will start where I was ending. I will start with Minister Gateta. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, indeed, the <coughs> question on quick wins is very, very important for us. And the question on quick wins uh, where I could give you so many examples mm -hmm. of the initiatives that we, that we are doing. Uh, let me just pick maybe three of them. Uh, one of them, uh, for the quick wins, we, have, we know that education is very, very important. But we know that education requires a lot, more than the university graduates. Actually, you find that the, uh, if I just give an ordinary example that we see, for each construction site, for one engineer, you need so many plumbers, you need so many electricians, you need so many, and these ones have skills that are not university graduates. Now, the training, the technical and vocational training becomes very, very important. And that's why we focus so that these people come up with quick skills that are going to serve our society. Just let me give you an example. After the genocide in Rwanda, we had a problem. We had no capacity at all. So if you go to a construction site, almost over 50% are Ugandans. If you go to the finance sector, there will be Kenyans. If you go to do a haircut, there will be a Congolese. If you go to water, there will be a Tanzanian. So you imagine the situation we are in if you had not allowed the people to come in. And what we are trying to do now is to see how we can educate massively for all the services that are required by the society. And the technical and vocational training becomes a quick win. Yes, the second one, we had so many people that, uh, I don't know if I'm running out of time. Yeah, well, a little bit. but. Okay, <laughs> so I just, I have so many examples that I, I, I wanted to, to show in terms of access to finance. For women, women for us, women, uh, the gender balance is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And that's why we put it in our constitution, where the, by we need at least 30% in decision making must be women. It's in our constitution. Mm -hmm. And that's why there are 64% women in parliament. Mm -hmm. and, and, and elsewhere, in all other institutions, it is well above 40%. Now, when it came to access to finance, what we did was we put a facility that's going to provide guarantees for women up to 75% so that they should be able to also have access to money with some guarantees because initially they didn't have 
any kind of assets that you can be proud of. In terms of the very poor people, we had to introduce one cow per poor family program. And I can tell you this has really changed the whole landscape. Because this time they can get milk, they can sell, they can get money, they can, it addresses the issues of nutrition, it addresses the issues of fertilizer, and in our case, it also addresses the issue of unity. Because in our culture, if I give you a cow, we are friends forever. And yeah. for people where there have been genocide, mm. this was very, very important. Mm. So the cow became a very important symbol for all of us. So I can go on, the, I ha we have the quick wins, yeah. which are very, mm. very, very important. Thank uh, you for giving concrete examples yeah. of that, Minister. And I will now turn to your uh, Canadian colleague. <laughs> minute, and please, uh, okay, one minute well, or so. Uh, well, maybe I can take the questions in, in a different order mm. and start with a question around um, the uh, potential policies in the United States. My main observation would be that in the United States, the, uh, the outcome of the election reflected anxiety of middle class Americans, uh, middle and lower income Americans that are concerned that the deal isn't working for them. Mm -hmm. so, so in a sense, we share that concern that we're trying to find ways to make an impact. I can't really opine on their policies, but I do think that they, uh, they are likely to work <coughs> towards dealing with that issue. I will see how they, they go about it. And our job will be to work with them to talk about how much of an impact we can have working together. Uh, trade has been very positive between Canada and the United States. Uh, many, many Canadian jobs, many, many American jobs are based on our mutual uh, trading uh, opportunities. That will be what we'll try and do as we work together. With respect to short-term wins, some of the things I talked about in my opening were, were they were short-term. We, mm -hmm. we lowered taxes immediately. We, we increased within a, a short number of months benefits for seniors, so single, impoverished seniors in many cases immediately got more uh, income, mm -hmm. so an immediate impact. The child benefits, immediate impact. Uh, so we've got some immediate things that allow us to do some of the longer-term things mm -hmm. that we think are going to have short-term impacts, like infrastructure will create jobs, but longer-term productivity and uh, other longer-term things like education. In our system, education is a provincial jurisdiction, but we believe that our effectiveness over the long term is going to be about education, training, retraining, skills development. And so we've, we've put in place some uh, significant uh, grant uh, measures to help uh, university students to get an education with less debt at the end, which enables a greater percentage of people to do that. Uh, and we will be increasingly talking about skills, how we can um, identify the skills needed in our economy, how we can help Canadians to know what they should be pointing towards as they do their studies or their training or their retraining, and thinking about how we can intervene in that effort to make sure that as people think about lifelong learning, because they'll have multiple careers, that we can intervene at the right times through information, through uh, you know, training initiatives that will make a difference. So it is a, a program with short and, and long-term yeah. aspects that we hope will have a, a positive impact on growth, but importantly, on inclusive growth. Thank you, Minister. And maybe one thing, if I can say just uh, one on education, that which maybe I didn't elaborate. When we started, it was very difficult. If a parent would be paying for your own kids. Mm -hmm. And now where we have reached is that we have the universal free primary and secondary mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. To reach that level, yeah. is showing the, how we have invested mm -hmm. just from the growth. This is the benefit of the growth that has been happening. At least we have reached that level where we have universal secondary, up to the secondary uh, level education. And I would love to continue mm -hmm. this discussion. We've just mm -hmm. started, but now we just have to end. Mm -hmm. 30 seconds, Rick. I think we've just heard some mm -hmm. really concrete, encouraging examples mm -hmm. of a different kind of way of generating growth. You know, they, they were not talking about, well, we've got to depreciate our currency and try to build up an export surplus. They're not talking about, well, no. we need to kind of cut interest rates as far as, as we can and put some quick fiscal stimulus in there. These are ways of what we just sort of engineering into the growth process itself and the domestic, much more resilient, sustainable type of way you generate growth. <laughs> and that is a new growth and development agenda, which I think is very hopeful for the world. And that's ultimately, Charlotte, to end, the, the constructive response to a lot of the political pressure, whether you're in a developing country or, an emerging, or in an advanced country, of addressing people's fundamental needs, which is improved living standards. Thank you very much, all of you, for, for being concrete, talking to the, to, to, be to the point, and for you to be here. Thank you, audience online. Thank you, audience in the room. 
uh, and uh, let's get out and inspire others to act and not just to talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.